Now, speaking of wacky, let's move on and talk about alternating tread devices. That's these things, and you can find lots of curious variations on Pinterest. There's a definition for these in Chapter 2, and you can pause and take a read. But the real details are in Chapter 3. These devices also can't be used for vertical egress between levels, unless there's already a compliant stairway or ramp serving that same habitable floor level. However, there is an exception for lofts, mezzanines, and similar areas that are not more than 200 gross square feet. This is meant to limit the use of these spaces by guests that might be a little less familiar with those wacky stairs. And gross square feet means that you measure the whole area, inclusive of any wall area separating a closet or the area underneath the guards. But let's unpack this a little bit further. Loft is a common term used for open portions of a second floor like this. And it's also a defined term in Appendix Q for tiny houses, where it also directly refers to being open to the main floor. And then a loft like this might also be a mezzanine by the code. A mezzanine has a pretty strict purpose, and it's mostly about being able to have a fourth story that's not a story above grade plane. And there's strict limitations for mezzanines in section 327, including this subsection about openness. So we see again a reference to be an open to the room below. And that's really a part of using this exception for the means of egress. It's another way that we really limit the usefulness of this space and then limit the using and the frequency of use of those devices. Now along those same lines of thinking, a space accessed by only an alternating tread device can't have a kitchen and it can't have a bathroom. This goes back to really limiting the need to use those devices. Okay, so let's say you've got a space that does work for some alternating treads. Let's go over their geometry. Now graphics for this are kind of tricky, so I'll show it to you in two ways. If we look at this very basic plan view looking down on alternating treads, the people would walk up in this manner with a tread for each foot on each side as they work their way up the stairs. They're half width treads. The leading edge of each tread, the nosings, are lined up on these dashed lines. And the minimum required five inch tread depth is measured like all other stairways, horizontally from nosing to nosing. But it's the nosing on the other side of the center. And there's this eight and a half inch minimum projected tread depth. And it's the clear space for each foot on each side to rise without hitting the underside of the nosing of the tread above on the same side. And it also allows for a forward facing descent. Now each tread's gotta be at least seven inches wide. And then finally the clear width at and below the handrails can't be less than 20 inches. But let's look at it from a side view. Here we see the minimum five inch tread depth and it's to, it's to the nosing of the next tread on the other side of the center. And then the maximum riser height is also to the next tread on the other side. And these dimensions establish the steepness of the stairway, which is further limited to between 50 and 70 degrees. Then there's the eight and a half inch projected tread depth. And this is the clear depth of each tread in reference to the tread directly above it on the same side. So let's look at this animation. The right foot steps up on the first side, then the left foot steps up on the other, followed by the right, and followed by the left. And this is the rate of horizontal, vertical, horizontal and vertical movement based on the riser height and tread depth. But alternating tread devices are designed for a forward approach walking down, just like other treads. And so the eight and a half inch projected tread depth allows you to step down to the next tread on the same side without clipping your heel on anything. 